is a presentation by Dr. Eric Milbrandt of the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation. This presentation is on nutrient drivers and consequences in Southwest Florida. The purpose of which is to provide information on the patterns of macroalgae abundance in the Gulf of Mexico and South Charlotte Harbor, including potential sources of nutrient loading and resulting responses of macroalgae. And this also relates to water quality improvement and monitoring priority actions of the CCMP. So, with that, I will hand things over to Dr. Milbrandt. Um, really excited to hear your presentation. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Um, one of my favorite topics is macroalgae. It's been something I've been interested in um, since I was an undergraduate. I did my undergraduate thesis on uh, the Rocky Coast, Pacific Northwest, looking at a wave, uh, wave action and then the morphology of a specific seaweed there. Um, didn't think I would be spending uh, much time on macroalgae when I arrived here in 2003 because uh, the, the seagrass was just absolutely spectacular. Um, I guess uh, we've seen kind of a lot more macroalgae seems like. Uh, it's been difficult to quantify uh, in the last 15 or so years. I think uh, Christine Angelini did a wonderful job of setting the stage as to we're kind of muddled in a bit of a, um, a, a understanding, a lack of understanding because there's so many complexities surrounding uh, the responses biologically. Um, and one of those responses seems to be a, a changing regime as far as maybe a lot more macroalgae in the system. And, and we've We've sort of been noticing this for a long time in the southern half of the CHNEP study area, um, especially around the Sanibel Causeway. Um, but this is a talk that I put together for the macroalgae uh, workshop um, and, and just want to summarize a few of the studies that, that uh, I've been involved in um, over the last 10 or so years. Uh, next. So I'll uh, give you a quick primer on macroalgae and forgive me um, for those of you that may have, have been participating in the, in the workshop and seen these slides already, but um, macroalgae are, um, are, can be essential ecosystem components. They're, they're often a common component of healthy seagrass ecosystems. Um, they have a high level of primary productivity. That also means that they sequester a large amount of nitrogen and and phosphorus potentially in their, in their tissue. Um, they contribute um, to dissolved organic carbon and, and detritus, which is a part of the food web for uh, microbial uh, food webs and, and the, the uh, this microinvertebrates and potentially provide uh, food, of course, for manatees, um, for uh, other fish and invertebrates and, and, and could be a an important dispersal mechanism uh, for, uh, for larvae of, uh, and juveniles. However, um, we've seen that the overabundance or overgrowth of macroalgae and in, in not just in Southwest Florida, but in several places around the world can have severe impacts. Um, one of the most visible was in China during the Olympics, where they had to shut down the venue for sailing and um, and other events because there was a massive uh, ulva bloom that had occurred there. We've experienced uh, some pretty bad blooms around Sanibel, um, and they resulted in huge piles of, of algae in the swash zone rotting, essentially generating uh, heat because they're rotting in the, in the sun and using up dissolved oxygen um, and, and increasing the sulfide toxicity in the swash zone um, on, on a barrier island. So that's, that's a pretty huge uh, stinky event. It affects a lot of people and businesses, but it's, a, it's also a big disturbance to, to our beach ecosystems. Um, the overgrowth can, uh, block light from seagrasses, both in terms of epiphytic growth on blades, but also just the, uh, the uh, covering up of large amounts of, 
macroalgae can increase that same interaction where you where you have decomposition, oxygen use, and increasing sulfide toxicity to uh, what's ever underneath there, whether it's seagrass or invertebrates or whatever. Um, and and of course we have heard and know about the nuisance uh, accumulations. They don't necessarily produce toxins, but they can produce really smelly beaches. Next. So uh, just a quick primer on, on macroalgae. These are images from our lab um, that we find that are more or less the common species, uh, the, some of the most common species that are around here. There are basically three main uh, types of macroalgae uh, that are based on their pigment composition. Um, the red uh, algae um, are shown here. They are um, often look very similar to one another, so it's very difficult to just produce a picture key and say, here you go, because a lot of the, um, the taxonomy is based on growth form. So you need to really look at cross sections uh, and branching patterns, which um, once you get a little bit of familiarity with some of the most common genre, it becomes a little easier, but I'm not a taxonomist by any means. I'm, I'm an ecologist. Uh, but in some ways, you have to really dive into some of the taxonomy, which makes macro, the study of macroalgae a little less accessible, I would say. Uh, next slide. So here's some of the more common brown algae species. One of the most abundant uh, seasonally um, that we have are Sargassum philopendula. These grow and, and we give reports uh, almost every year, this time of year, they, the sporophyte grows uh, very large, um, like almost kelp-like um, branching uh, um, algae in the water, and and they they appear in places that um, you know you wouldn't expect in a little bit deeper water. But what happens is the um, the the annual is this part, and the perennial is this very small part that grows in a shell fragment. Um, and is there year round, and this part breaks off, and of course goes along and, and um, spreads uh, its spores around and into other places. But this time of year, you'll especially see it in Mountain Shade Pass. You'll see it a lot around uh, Ding Darling and at Bunch Beach. Uh, next slide. And there are several uh, green al algae uh, that that are common. Um, I've shown here uh, Ulva, which used to be split into a few different genres, now all the same. It's a sheet or a tube-like uh, green algae. Um, filamentous forms of green algae are also uh, pretty common, rhizoclonium, Bonophora. And then um, more recently, we've become, uh, um, our attention has been turned more towards Calerpa, which can form large patches. It's almost plant-like in, in that it has differentiation of uh, leaf-like um, and root-like tissues, which is quite unusual for macroalgae. Um, and we've been seeing uh, filamentous green algae mats become part of a problem, uh, become a problem more so in the last two or three years um, in Charlotte Harbor. Next. So a little bit more on these mats. Um, it's there. We first encountered them in Ding Darling uh, in 2020, but they've also been reported and we've looked at specimens from the East Wall of Charlotte Harbor. Um, the green algae when they're in these filamentous mats are often intermixed. There's a bunch of different things in there. It can be cyanobacteria that are filaments. It can be um, single unisariate or single cell um, filaments, and it can also be these forms um, that are multinucleate. Um, so things like Boucheria. Um, so when, when we first uh, initially looked at it, we thought it could be some kind of bryopsis. Um, we also found um, a, a Sacoglossin gastropod in really high abundance in Ding Darling, and um, my colleagues, Mark and, and Rick Bartleson, Mark Thompson, Rick Bartleson, 
um, did some more research on the on the gastropod oxyno and contacted some experts in that field, and they uh, they pretty much said that it's only ever been described on Calerpa. So um, after um, looking a little bit closer at the morphology, um, we were able to find the root like it looks like a um, a multinucleate. Um, uh, Dallas, but it has a little root like um, uh, morphology. So we uh, identified it then as Calerpa fastia gata. So, um, oh, next slide. So, uh, just a little bit sort of more background, um, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit. Most of, of our research, um, we kind of split into studying. Um, algae that was uh, attached or entangled at the place, but what what's true of most microalgae in Charlotte Harbor is that it drifts around and it, it continues to grow once it breaks loose from uh, any attachment point. Um, so the, the biomass often accumulates um, in seagrass areas or in uh, in on beaches. Of course, beaches are are places where uh, things that are drifting are, are stranded and, and accumulate, um, and and they're very good at this, and especially the red branching algae that we have here um, can are very happy being broken in half, and they'll continue to grow, especially if there's nitrogen. Next slide. So the result, of course, um, we've seen a few pictures of this. That there's um, there's some pretty major ecological um, implications for this, including low DO. Um, they're not necessarily associated with fish kills, but certainly um, can be associated with some kind of habitat change or habitat loss, especially seagrass. Next. So in, in terms of drivers, um, I think Christine uh, earlier laid out a number of, um, you know, complications of our, our system and, and entanglement of various drivers. But I just wanted to show you sort of two classic conceptual ideas of um, a river discharge in a deep water system like the Chesapeake Bay driving phytoplankton blooms. Um, and, and that decomposition of phytoplankton bloom is six to the bottom and there's um, seasonal, there's stratification, there's anoxia, and then there's uh, a, a sort of a benthic uh, recycling of nutrients that happens. The alternative to that is a shallow water system, which I would consider most of Charlotte Harbor a shallow water system. And the Clusahatchee is a little bit different because it has a deep channel through the middle of it, but certainly San Carlos Bay, Pine Island Sound, um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the, sh the shallow seagrass areas, Mount Shea Pass, would be could be characterized as this, which is you have not necessarily um, river discharges, but we do, um, but also loads uh, coming from groundwater, and that stimulates um, growth of not just phytoplankton, but also growth of macroalgae and and seagrass, and then there's this enhanced uh, coupling because there's so much biology happening. Um, on, on the bottom in terms of, of respiration and photosynthesis and nutrient uh, cycling. Next. So um, with that, I'm going to describe two research projects that I've been involved in. The first was a two year study of um, the Bay and the Gulf of Mexico, trying to understand stranding events on the beach. Um, it involved a large team of scientists from Florida Gulf Coast University um, and uh, Nova Southeastern University and um, one investigator that I'll mention later from Woods Hole. But my part or our part of this was to study the community composition and distribution of algae through time. And we found kind of two different community types. We found a, a, a a Gulf community and a sound community, which would be like the Bay community. And they differ based on their species composition. And you can see that in the um, in the drawing. I think if you click through 
um, a few slides, Nicole, some bubbles will show up. Yeah, keep going. And then that just shows you that in, in our analysis that they um, were compositionally distinct, but interestingly, they are also distinct in terms of when the peak biomass occurred. In the Gulf of Mexico, the peak biomass occurred in, in the summer months when it's warmer. Um, presumably, there's some input of, of river discharge um, and there's a lag effect in growth. Whereas in the south, the peak biomass occurred during the winter months when uh, the water was less dark because of, of the tannin compound tent. It was higher salinity and, um, and it produces, it seemed like, uh, and the patterns would suggest a lot more macroalgae um, when seagrass especially was uh, just sort of in there dormant or less, uh, less of a growth phase, I guess. So next slide. A second study that I was involved in um, was just a uh, an intern who had an interest, and we were constantly getting reports about um, a lot of macroalgae around the Sanibel Causeway. So this is a, a very quick snapshot. Just keep that in mind. This was uh, conducted during a two-week period in January of 2017 when there seem to be a lot of macroalgae around. Um, and we basically used a method uh, that was developed for Tampa Bay by Roger Johansson um, in the 80s, where they used a, a, an otter trawl and, and uh, collected macroalgae using the otter trawl. And for the, the methodology, it, it works really great. Um, you can use a volumetric displacement method. So we basically took the, the trawl, we recorded the track to get our, our distances, um, <clears throat> calculated the volume that we sampled, and then took the volume of the macroalgae once it was placed in the bucket and the water was displaced, we measured the water and then calculated uh, from a subsample of biomass. Next, please. It's a, a great method because you can cover a lot of ground fairly quickly. Um, we were basically just looking for patterns related to uh, the, the main source of fresh water in uh, this part of, of the Charlotte Harbor ecosystem, uh, uh, which is the Clusahatchee River. Um, and so we developed a study design based on uh, the distance from shell point or the, the mouth of the main part of the discharge for the Clusahatchee. And you can kind of see that it, there's, there's, it wasn't statistically significant, but there was some pretty strong evidence that um, there was a source effect from the Clusahatchee, that higher biomass of macroalgae was found closer to uh, the mouth of the Clusahatchee. Now, uh, that being said, if you look at the pattern of the of the data and the colors are hot, the higher colors are higher biomass um, and the cooler colors are lower. You can see that there are some anom anomalies, certainly, like in Ding Darling, there's a hot spot. And, and so we just guessed, we don't really know, but um, we think those are areas where macroalgae gets trapped and then they're growing because of internal nutrient cycling or, or whatever. But, there could be other local nutrient sources, such as groundwater that are fueling some of that. But Ding Darling, as a drainage, if you looked at where the bridges and, and mounds are and where the drainage is off of Sanibel, most of the discharge uh, for surface water and groundwater is on the east end of the island. There's all pretty much all conservation land. So it seems like um, not there's not a lot of evidence for groundwater in the, in that particular case of being a, a driver of, of the algal growth. Next slide. So um, back to um, back to the two year study, we did some isotopic analysis, and stable isotopes have been used to look at sources of um, of nitrogen use and uptake in, in seaweeds and other things too. Um, so 
some would argue and can argue that if you can look at the enrichment N15, that lower values indicate a fertilizer source and higher values indicate a um, manure or wastewater source. Um, we used uh, Delta N15 in a little bit different way. Uh, we collected uh, a bunch of specimens from around the Gulf and compared them to Pine Island Sound and consistently found that the enriched nitrogen was in Pine Island Sound. And this offered a possible way of, of determining where algae on the beach was coming from, because that was the goal of our project, is really to understand what was causing the beach stranding events. But um, interestingly, in, in just looking at and hearing Brian LaPointe's talk during the macroalgae workshop, I think um, there's, there's, he's used um, uh, stable isotopes in a very different way. Um, what he found in 2007 was that during the dry season, there was enriched delta N15, and it was different during the wet season. And he suggests that that's an indication of a shift in, in nutrient source. So I know this is kind of going to be a little bit of a leap um, to where I go next, but next slide. I'm going to skip this slide. We can come back to it if we need to next. Um, okay, so I'm just going to just pause for a second and go back to tell you about how um, if you fragment these plants, we did some lab experiments, and this work was done by uh, an intern at the time named Leah Breedenbach, who's now on our staff. But if you, if you give nitrogen, uh, inorganic nitrogen, to fragmented macroalgae, and all the three of the four species that we gave it to, which are common species in the bay, all respond to nitrogen, and they continue to grow, no problem. There's one species that didn't. Um, so that was interesting, but next slide. Going back to the source of, of nutrients, uh, again, I'm, I'm kind of making a pretty big leap here based on some work that was done um, during the two-year study. Um, our colleague, Matt Charette, uh, is a marine chemist, and he uses um, radium uh, isotopes to track uh, groundwater fluxes. So when water is in the ground for a certain amount of time, it, it mixes with radioactive materials that um, are traceable, essentially. So I know I'm simplifying that in a big way. Uh, but he did it uh, uh, during a, our year-long period of time. He sampled four times. He sampled during the wet period, and he sampled during the dry period. And he compared those fluxes of nutrients from groundwater, which on the right hand side is the darker bars. Um, it's submarine groundwater discharge. So that's that's flux of inorganic nutrients from groundwater is the dark bars versus flow from S79, which are the, the lighter gray bars. <clears throat> so what he was what he was finding is that during the, the dry season in particular, um, groundwater nutrient fluxes can be high relative to that of S79, because of course S79, the flows are lower during the dry period. So relatively speaking, there can be high fluxes uh, in the Clusahatchee. And he sampled, you can see the map on the left side throughout the system um, in the estuary, in the upper estuary and in the Gulf of Mexico. So what he suggest, suggested is that um, relatively higher inorganic nutrient fluxes, um, which are more bioavailable, um, and are present during the dry period and, and can uh, help continue the growth of macroalgae or may then fuel macroalgal growth. Uh, next slide. So um, our two, uh, three colleagues from FGCU put together in 2010, so keep that in mind, this is 10 years old now, um, they did a um, a budget, if you will, based on South Florida Water Management District plus this data from the submarine groundwater uh, discharge. Um, they put together this table, um, and and it was um, Mike Parsons, um, I Low, and Win Everham put this together. And what is shown in this? Uh, go ahead and click the next slide, Nicole. It's not the next slide. I think it'll highlight some sections. Go ahead and um, one more. Okay, so. What this sh table shows is dry season um, loads of TN, TP, and then wet season loads, TN, TP, 
So the dry season loads are in red, the wet season loads are loads are in blue, um, and the percent total is in black. And it's surprising that, um, you know, based on the groundwater fluxes that you measure, a surprisingly high amount of, uh, of load during the dry period in particular um, are, are a significant percentage of the total um, annual loads to the estuary. Next slide. All right, so then there's this idea that um, uh, we, we tried to we tried to get at with the, with the algae study, but never were able to. Um, but that is that um, in the Caribbean, in the far left graph, uh, talks about um, uh, the the change, the regime shift, to use the word used earlier, uh, in the shift between declines in coral reef covers versus increases in uh, macroalgae covers over uh, a decade or more. And this pattern is showing up all over the Caribbean. Uh, and, and the mechanism of this, the driver for this is thought to be uh, top-down control, but there's a lot of de debate and discussion. So removing large fish um, has changed the food web to the point where you no longer have the grazers on the macroalgae, and thus you have an overgrowth of, of macroalgae. That's that's kind of the idea here. Um, and I guess what I'm suggesting is that um, we've had now recurring red tide blooms um, since 2017. Um, they've, they've been strong enough. They've caused widespread, especially 2018, uh, mortality of fish uh, and wildlife, unfortunately. Um, so what is this doing to, um, to our macroalgae uh, abundances. Next. So this is just a, kind of a modified from a classic paper uh, on regime shifts, um, looking at seagrass dominated versus algae dominated ecosystems um, and what what the drivers can be to lead to uh, a shift away from seagrass uh, and, and towards the algae dominated. And, and instead of overfishing, I just wrote in there recurring red tide because I think it is important to consider. I don't know how to measure it. Um, I, I don't. We've looked at at grazers of of macroalgae in, in just in some gut contents of fish, uh, but we don't really know much about what's going on with that. But I think it's important. Thanks. Well, so my colleague Mark. Um, he helped me modify this um, uh, diagram that was originally published um, for the New England area, looking at a bunch of small estuaries um, around uh, Cape Cod. And he, at the time, they were comparing uh, Sage Lot Pond, which had a relatively pristine watershed, versus uh, the Cosmet River and the Childs River, which were agriculture or urban. Uh, urbanized to show the loads per year versus kind of the proportion of seagrass macroalgae and phytoplankton. And Mark uh, calculated uh, where we are in terms of the last five years for the Clusahatchee River, uh, the Clusahatchee and the St. Lucie side. So we're kind of, you know, we're not obviously not pristine, but we're not over on the, the really agricultural urban side. But I think um, I think it's it's important to just think about where we are in this um, uh, conceptual diagram. There are a lot of complexities that it's not as simple to. Uh, there's not really two axes here that we can compare, um, and and I think that's sort of leading to to why we don't have any great explanations about macroalgae. Next. So um, I don't know if I need to read all of these uh, off. Um, I think I think um, I appreciate your attention, and uh, I'm very interested in uh, continuing to collaborate with uh, with the aquatic preserve staff who have been ta just taking on macroalgae and some of the IDs to try and get over that hurdle uh, to to try and better understand what's going on with with macroalgae uh, in in our system. But I guess what I um, what I'd like to, to conclude with is that um, 
I think we, we can, there are places where we can improve um, whether or not we, we can, whether or not groundwater inorganic nutrients are an important source for macroalgae is a, a research area that we can definitely um, make some progress on. Um, we know that the Clusahatchee is a huge source of TN. There's evidence that it's driving some of this microalgae in, in San Carlos Bay. And, you know, we, we can't ignore this uh, recurring red tide wounds. And, and however, uh, you know, we say, well, let's, our message should always be to try and reduce nutrients. And to Dave Seeley's point earlier, we need to get nutrient uh, and water nutrient reduction and water quality included in some of these big Everglades uh, projects. That's absolutely true, but we also need more incentives for people to use less fertilizer, to drive their cars less, uh, all those things that are inputting more nutrients into the coastal zone to try and reduce um, those, those balloons from occurring. Uh, I think that's the last slide. Next. A lot of people help me and I'd be happy to um, answer any questions or um, I'll put my email in the chat and, and you all can email me. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Milbrand. That was a really great presentation. Um, very interesting stuff. Uh, specifically, the to me, the, the higher nutrient loads during the dry season um, and groundwater it seems to point possibly to septic systems potentially yeah there's there's legacy uh nutrients throughout i know we we've got um wastewater centralized wastewater treatment on sanibel but not on captiva you have um we're, we're working to move that in a different to towards central sewer um you know pine island is is mostly um I believe mostly septic systems and Cape Coral is is a mix and Fort Myers has mostly central sewer, but then you know, as you move upstream, you have a lot of, of septic uh, tanks and I think Lee County leads maybe the state in the number of, uh, of, of septic tanks. So it's certainly, you know, it's, it's not a new debate, um, but it would be nice to be able to make those connections with uh, either legacy nutrients and groundwater to some of the changes that we're seeing. Um, if anybody has any questions for uh, for Eric, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself. And I see one in the chat, Devin. Okay. Um, believe, I, can, uh, I can read it and, and address it. That's fine. I got okay. open. Um, is there value in harvesting macroalgae as a nutrient removal technique, perhaps uh, preferentially in low circulation areas? So um, that's an, a very interesting point uh, that the federal government over the last few years had um, an RFP to explore the feasibility of, of this. And in Southwest Florida, there's a really high um, there's a, they put a bunch of factors into a model and it showed that maybe macroalgae as a uh, nutrient sequestering and um, as a, maybe an energy source would, would, would be a, a good place to sort of develop that kind of economy. Um, however, I think there would be many uh, um, effects of just collecting wild algae with a net, for example, you, there's always bycatch. Um, I think if there is a way to get it off the beach without having heavy equipment, um, we on Sanibel, I know um, there was a, an attempt to try and use a pump. Uh, they, they use pumps in Hawaii to concentrate algae from large water bodies. They suck it up, goes through a sucker, and and, um, and then they they capture the algae. But on the beach, it's just impossible. The the it's such a dynamic place. There's waves, and, and then you still have to have, you know, a, a, a big dumpster. And I think of the the three yard dumpster that they put out on the beach. They I think they may have gotten, um, you know, a, a quarter of a yard, so like an eighth of it. Um, so, so I think you'd have to really examine the the ecological uh, implications of 
of harvesting it. However, it is a very efficient sequestration tool for algae. So if you could maybe put out, I don't know how you would do this, but put out racks or nets or something where you could harvest it a little off the bottom away from seagrass, let it grow and then collect it. Um, that might be the way to go. Uh, one other question in the chat, if you don't mind, Chair, um, is how can aquatic preserves modify their monitoring to help future efforts? Um, yeah, so uh, that's from Mindy Brown, who's um, the, the lead of the, um, the Charlotte Harbor Aquatic Preserves. Um, I think we should talk a little bit more about that. I know we, um, in, in Estero Bay, they have a, a more uh, systematic monitoring uh, going on, and, and if we could develop that systematic monitoring, for instance, we started in Ding Darling 10 sites. We study seagrass at those 10 sites. We just started collecting macroalgae once a year there. So I think, as someone said um, in the macroalgae workshop, it's like planting a tree. The best day to plant a tree was 50 years ago, but should plant a tree today. So we should start doing some collective monitoring efforts, coordinated, obviously. And I'm willing to help get over the hurdle of the identifications. Um, it's not necessarily that important. Sometimes just the biomass uh, number itself is, is relevant. Very good. Um... Thank you again, uh, Dr. Milbrandt. Uh, great presentation. It, it was really amazing to hear about all that and excited to see where that monitoring goes in the future. Um, with that, I believe we're going to go ahead and move forward. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, 